द लॉ ऑफ कर्मा अघोरा थ्री बाई रॉबर्ट स्वबोधा चैप्टर सेवन रीपे इज बींग कंटिन्यूड लाइक शीप पीपल इजिली बिकम लॉस्ट इन द वाइल्डरनेस ऑफ द विल्डरनेस ऑफ द वर्ल्ड दैट इज वाई दे नीड प्रोटेक्शन जीसस इज प्रिपेर टू गो आउट इन टू द विल्डरनेस टू सेव दोज शीप टू सर्च फॉर दैम अंटिल ही फाइंड्स दैम एंड कैरीज दैम होम विथ हिम This is why there is no need for intelligence in Jesus's religion which is one of the pure love in fact you can hamper your progress in your sadhana of Jesus if you use your intelligence you simply have to be ready to follow whatever Jesus leads you wherever Jesus leads you in perfect faith that as long as you follow him you can never go astray The main difficulty with everyone is that they have no faith. The Jesus used to complain about this all the time. One way in which animals are better than humans is that they have no conscious self-interest. They do not anguish all the time about what happened in the past and what is yet to come. Humans forget that God is doing everything for us already, so there is no need to prepare anything. It is only because of our ill fate that any of us worry. If we did not worry we would be perennially happy for we would accept whatever god chose to offer us according to our karmas but the weight of our karmas interferes with our happiness it causes us to plan and anticipate and to experience anxiety and worry look at how we planned repays run and worried out its outcome when when we could have just relaxed and let god do his work this is why a saint is the only truly happy person a real saint has gone beyond worry here is a question for you millions of people bathe in the external river ganga every day all the authorities the saints the holy books say that bathing in the ganges washes away all evil karmas if this is true why hasn't anybody Why hasn't everyone who bathes in the Ganga become enlightened by now since you become enlightened when your karmic burden is lightened since you become enlightened when your karmic burden is lightened good question i don't think i know why well let us assume that you bathe in the ganga and come out perfectly clean of karma but as soon as you step out into onto the river bank you start to perform new karmas again wala there you are right back in the soup which is why there is no escape from the law of karma until you change your consciousness though we humans imagine that we are in charge of our destinies fate is far more complicated than you can even imagine he settled back with his scotch while guzzles emanated from a well worn recording of the famous vocalist begum akhtar and began again even rishis can be bewildered by fate consider the case of parashar rishi who was an authority on jyotish a subject which is nothing more or less than the knowledge of the play of the nine planets one day as parashara walked through a fishing village on the river yamuna a realization struck him like a flash of lightning he saw that a child conceived at a precise instant on that day would become one of the greatest of sages and a redactor of the vedas a rishi can give birth to thousands of beings simply by wiping the sweat off his forehead but fate perverted parashara's mind he decided instead that he should enjoy sex with a girl himself and father a child through copulation that this would cause him to lose the fruits of centuries of his penance did not occur to him at that time as fate would have it a beautiful young fisher girl named matsya gandhi that is fishy order was standing nearby she was not an extraordinary girl her father was a king and her mother was a celestial damsel who had taken the form of a fish as the result of a curse she was called matsya gandhi because her body smelled fishy only to be expected if your mother was a fish but i read that her real name was satyavati maybe so but i call her matsya gandhi parashara hailed her and explained his plan without any hesitation back then people were not as embarrassed about such things as they are today 
द गर्ल रेडीली एग्रीड टू दिस प्रपोजल थिंकिंग टू बिकम द मदर ऑफ ए ऋषिज चाइल्ड इज ए रेयर ब्लेसिंग बट शी टोल्ड हिम इट वुड नॉट बी गुड टू एन्जॉय सेक्स राइट हेयर इन द विलेज लेट एस गो आउट ऑन टू द वाटर सो दे गॉट इन टू ए बोट एंड वेंट आउट इन टू द मिडल ऑफ द वाटर वेयर पराशरा क्रिएटेड एन आईलैंड फॉर देयर लव मेकिंग then when parashara approached her she said the sun is witnessing our play please request him to turn away so darkness fell at the precise moment when the child had to be conceived after their love play was over parashara was pleased and granted matsya gandhi the boon of permanent body fragrance thereafter she was called yojana granthi she whose fragrance can be smelled at a distance of 8 miles the child who was born the same day that he was conceived was krishna dark complexioned due to the darkness at his conception dwipayana born on an island vyasa the compiler who is commonly known as veda vyasa veda arranger besides reworking the veda vyasa composed a number of literary masterpieces including the great epic of more than 100000 verses known as the mahabharata and the sublime story of lord krishna that is the shrimad bhagavata if vyasa had never been born none of these stories would ever have appeared in our world but isn't there something strange about all this i drew a blank why did he ever get the idea to write these stories down does a rishi have any use for the written word none whatsoever he always prefers to use paravani telepathic speech but vyasa was the son of a shudra girl shudras are mired in the awareness of the physical it is natural they have to toil hard to earn a living and their minds focus on their toil the only reason that the thought of a physical representation of his knowledge even entered vyasa's mind was this mundane influence on his intellect vyasa was born as he was because nature wanted that all this who should be written down for the benefit for those of us who live in kali yuga parashara's intellect was perverted precisely because nature needed the offspring of a brahmana and a shudra to redact the vedas and create the mahabharata and the shrimad bhagavata isn't nature wonderful this is and there is another reason why the caste system is no longer applicable in this origin in its original form even today no orthodox brahmana will accept into his family any son of a brahmana father and a shudra mother but that was vyasa's parentage and what he accomplished no other brahmana could accomplish does this make him better or worse than an orthodox brahmana neither he is what he is is distinguished immortal vyasa was once asked to father children of two princesses he agreed and like his father before him decided to use sexual intercourse instead of some other method to fulfill his commitment why did he prefer physical sex because his consciousness was affected even if minimally by the fact that he had been born as a result of a sexual act look at how deep and long lasting the effects of sexual karma can be unfortunately vyasa's preference for sex created some uninten- unintentional karmas of its own the first princess was so terrified by vyasa's imposing demeanor that she paled when he embraced her this caused pandu her son to be born pale the second could not endure vyasa's intense aura and closed her eyes which caused her son dhritarashtra to be born blind was it that simple it is that simple when you are dealing with a rishi a woman takes a man's shakti when he ejaculates into her and nourishes that shakti with her own shakti to create a child when the women and the man have more or less equal shaktis as they usually do when they are both humans their shaktis will have a more or less equal influence on the child that results but a rishi is not a human a rishi is a super duper who has super shakti and only a similarly super woman will be able to unite with him as an equal any human any human woman who tries to unite with him will function mainly as the mold into which he pours his shakti 
इफ द वुमेन डज नॉट ओपन हर सेल्फ टू हिम कम्प्लीटली द ऋषिज शक्ति विल नॉट पेनिट्रेट हर इवेंटली द मोल्ड विल डज नॉट बी कम्प्लीटली फिल्ड एंड वेर एवर द शक्ति डज नॉट रीच देर विल बी ए डिफिशियंसी इन द चाइल्ड ओके द फर्स्ट प्रिंसेस वॉज देन रिक्वेस्टेड टू रिटर्न टू द ऋषि फॉर एनदर ट्राई एट प्रोड्यूसिंग ए हेल्दी क्राउन प्रिंस बट शी वॉन्टेड नो मोर ऑफ दैट सो शी secretly sent her servant girl instead the girl had no inhibitions and was so pleased that she was going to enjoy sex with a rishi that she surrendered herself completely to him through her surrender some fragment of vyasa's super qualities were transmitted through her into the fetus who became her son vidura these qualities made vidura clairvoyant from birth let us let me get something straight i interrupted the mahabharata war was fought between the five sons of pandu and the 100 sons of dhritarashtra which means that it was actually fought between two sets of grandsons of vyasa precisely my my a civil war that was really all in the family no wonder vyasa had to write the mahabharata it was a family history yes but there is more one of pandu's five sons was yudhishthira another was arjuna the great warrior who was lord krishna's great friend arjuna sired abhimanyu out of subhadra krishna's sister and abhimanyu died in the war because arjuna had stolen subhadra but before his death abhimanyu had impregnated his wife uttara with parikshit and it is thanks to Krish- king parikshit that we have the shrimad bhagavata the shrimad bhagavata was transmitted to parikshit by the suta who heard it from the great rishi sukhadeva who heard it from his father vyasa sukhadeva being yet another of vyasa's children he was the most amazing of vyasa's children for he was not born from a womb he escaped the taint of copulation by springing insects instead from the rubbing of the arani the sticks used to create fire for vedic sacrifices this is why he is called arani putra son of the arani because sukhadeva was born not born as a result of sex he did not discriminate according to gender celestial damsels would throng to him as he roamed naked in the jungle they would feel completely relaxed with him because he never showed the slightest trace of awareness of their sexual identity but if vyasa approached the women would quickly hide for they could feel that he saw them in a different way even though he was also pure minded yes even though he never lusted after them vyasa's awareness was ever so slightly sexual because of his birth that was enough to make a difference Vyasa created the Srimad Bhagavata for his own pleasure and for the pleasure of his son Sukadeva. He might never have released it to the world had he not wanted King Parikshit to obtain moksha liberation by hearing it. Parikshit had been cursed by a rishi to die by being bitten by a snake. As the king listened to the suta recite the Srimad Bhagavata for 7 days, Parikshit released his attachments to the world and welcomed death when it arrived. Why would Vyasa want Parikshit to obtain moksha? Why wouldn't he? He wanted to wind up the karmas of that branch of his family and what better way to do it than arrange for his great great grandson's liberation? How would that help the family? Haven't you been paying attention if you had can help yourself out by doing Pitri tarpana for your ancestors you can help your ancestors out even more by becoming liberated it is the same sort of thing are you saying that vyasa released the shrimad bhagavata into the world just to save his great great grandson and to improve his family's karmic pedigree that was his immediate purpose but by doing so he also ensured that it would be handed down to posterity how did that happen the suta who was present when sukhadeva recited it to parikshit later retold the shrimad bhagavata to a group of sages who had assembled in the naimisharanya these sages and their disciples were responsible for introducing the shrimad bhagavata 
to the rest of the world you should only read or listen to the shrimad bhagavata when you are ready to absorb temporarily or permanently the mundane outside world as those sages who had withdrawn from the world into naimisharanya did though the naimisharanya is a forest in north india some writers have proposed that the world also be read as the forest aranya of blinking naimisha which would refer to the inside of the human body a sojourn in the naimisharanya would then imply a turning inward or the normally outward pointed senses to heighten awareness of the inner cosmos and like parikshit vimal vimalananda continued you must cultivate your interior interiority if you hope to enter into the inner astral world of the shrimad bhagavata what does parikshit mean tested technically speaking parikshit means surrounding extending as heaven and earth extend out to surround us but i knew that vimalananda was thinking of the word parikshit which means tested exactly only when a disciple is completely tested is he eligible to be taught you should understand from his name that king parikshit had gone through the grind he had become thoroughly prepared for the knowledge that was given to him anyone who wants to get the real juice out of the shrimad bhagavata needs to be prepared to self identify with king parikshit when they listen to when you hear if you need to be able to temporarily become parikshit which you will only be able to do if you have been painstakingly tested so king parikshit was delivered this wisdom via the suta i thought suta was just a word that means son suta does mean sun but it is also but it also means the mental mercury a woman after delivery a charioteer it has to it has so many meanings because it is a sanskrit word all these meanings must be related you are a student of sanskrit you tell me what these things have in common well i was struck i was stuck they are all carriers they transport essence around in the world until it reaches the point where it can manifest think it over they deliver things they represent the cosmic courier service yes they deliver the sutta's father was the charioteer roma harshana who was personally killed by lord krishna seemingly by mistake but in fact as a blessing how was that how have you ever heard that the father lives on through the son yes a child transports the essence of its parents their genes and chromosomes roma harshana was not pure enough to act as a fit vehicle for shrimad bhagavata but when krishna killed him he purified him this made roma harshana's son pure enough to deliver the shrimad bhagavata to the world roma harshana must have already been quite an advanced soul otherwise he would not have even been fit to be killed and purified by krishna himself but he was not quite pure enough what does roma harshana mean in sanskrit horripilation goose flesh the body hairs stand on end which is caused by cold fear or some other strong simulation including spiritual experiences roma harshana was highly evolved but not quite evolved enough to transport this particular shakti did lord krishna's act of killing roma harshana serve as a sort of pitritarpana for the roma harshana's family yes if you want to look at it that way well roma harshana's death paved the way for the transmission of the shrimad bhagavata which has benefited millions of people some of those benefited are are bound to bless it and its writers and some percentage of those blessings are bound to flow to those who arranged to transport it to us no sort of an ongoing astral royalty payment i think we can be confident that the shrimad bhagavata has enormously benefited everyone who was involved in bringing bringing it to light in our world and all their ancestors too it particularly benefited parashara who by stirring vyasa made it all possible and parashara certainly needed some benefit to help counteract the karma that he incurred by inseminating 
Matsya Gandhi. While it was very good for the world that Vyasa was born, it did not do Parashara much good to have enjoyed sex with a Shudra. That act entangled him in the play of her karmas which were of a pattern quite different from his. These karmas forced Parashara to take birth again to experience the exper expercutions of his act. Every taint and especially that of copulation must be erased. Is copulation such a big taint then? Do you remember that you once asked me about a certain Vedic sacrifice in which beer is brewed? Months have passed but he had not forgotten. Yes, the Sautramani sacrifice. I had asked you why the ritual text specifies from that the barley from which the beer will be brewed must be taken from a eunuch. Here is your answer. The rishis who created this sacrifice intended the barley to be collected from someone who is born eunuch, not from a eunuch who has been cut. A natural eunuch has not even been exposed to the energy of sex, much less the experience of copulation. Such a person has the potential to be the living embodiment of the Nirakara Tattva. The principle of formlessness because what is sex about if not the creation of new forms. But even a natural eunuch only has the potential to embody formlessness. Didn't the Rishi expect the sacrificer to locate someone who had realized this formless potential and not just find an old barley donating natural eunuch? Exactly. Our Rishis were not fools. What possible use would an ordinary eunuch have been to them? The essence is what counts, not the outer garb. Is this the sort of thing that Jesus was talking about when he talked about someone who makes himself a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake? I was thinking of Matthew 19.12. Yes, the same sort of thing. And remember that in this context, Jesus says that this is not for everyone but only for those who properly understand it, maybe for those who have the ears to hear and the eyes to see. Oh, so the copulation taint was strong enough to force Parashara to take birth yet again. It was. Unfortunately, Parashara's personality in his new body was rather dull. His father tried to teach him many things, but he failed. Exasperated, he asked his son, Why can't you learn anything? I tried to teach you. The boy answered, I don't know father, I suppose it must be due to my past karmas. The father got wild on hearing this from his dull-witted son and told him, You had better get out of here and do go do Gayatri. So the boy went out into the forest. Here the father's intellect had been perverted. How could the boy help it if his past Karmas were bad and what father would begrudge his own son his past faults. Parents are there to forgive not to curse but without this order from his father the boy would not have succeeded so quickly. His father probably did not know it but it was important for Parashara to do sadhana of the son. Why? Because Parashara had deliberately sent the son away on that fateful day when he had impregnated Matsya Gandha. So even that was a karma. A big karma. You have to be very careful when you play about with the nine planets. The boy found himself a good spot and made a hammock of twelve stout ropes made of creepers braced with three cross ropes. He strung his hammock between two trees and sat on it with a fire beneath him representing the Gayatri Mantra. Every year he cut one of the ropes so that after eleven years he was balancing on a single strand. When the twelve years were almost up, he said to himself, If I do not succeed at perfecting this mantra and obtaining a vision of the sun god at the end of these twelve years, there will be nothing to do but put an end to myself. But deities are not cruel. They are really very kind. On the last day of his penance, he saw a sadhu approaching him. The sadhu had an unworldly effulgent glow about him. And the boy realized that the son himself, Surya Narayana, had come to him in human form. He bowed to the sadhu and Lord Surya said to him, So my boy, what do you want? The boy asked for proficiency in astrology. Why would he ask for it? Both because of his previous expertise in astrology as Parashara, that influence was beginning to re-exert itself. And because who better than the son 
to teach astrology. Lord Surya then blessed him, saying, Your name will last as long as the sun and moon exist as the greatest ever expert in astrology. Then he disappeared and the boy left his place of penance. When he reached his home, his remorse-filled father recognized him and tearfully said, I don't care if you are a dud or not. Please come and embrace me. When the boy responded with a beautiful Sanskrit verse, his father realized that yes, he had indeed been doing Gayatri all the time, for Gayatri is the mother of the Sanskrit. Over the course of time, this boy, now called Mihracharya, in honor of his penance, Mihira is one of the names of sun, became a gem at the king's court. When the king's son was born, the court astrologers were directed to predict his fate. All except Mihira said that the boy would live long, rule wisely and enjoy his glory. Mihira alone said the boy will die at age 3 on such and such a date at this exact moment, gored to death by a varaha, wild boar. The king said, Please, Mihira, everyone else had has said something good. Kindly change your prediction. Mihira replied, I am sorry, O king, but it will happen as I have said. That is his fate. The king built a seven-story building and put his son on the top floor, surrounded by a strong guard so that no boar could get up, could get to him. When the appointed day arrived, the king and all the jealous courtiers were waiting to see Mihira proved wrong and then punished. Exactly at the given moment, the, flag, the flagstaff on the seventh story of the building broke and fell on top of the little boy who happened to be playing below it. Atop the flagpole was sat the king's symbol, which was a boar's head made of solid gold and weighing more than 80 pounds. When this image landed on the child, one of his golden tusks pierced his chest and he died instantly. Mihira said to the shocked king, O king, the boar has killed the boy as I predicted. The grieving king replied, You are the wisest of my astrologers. In honor of this brilliant prediction, I now name you Varaha Mihira. Varaha Mihira went on to write many well-known treatise as astrology. His system follows Parashara's system, though with only a few principles changed here and there. As it should, after all, he had only recently been Parashara. But even Varaha Mihira did not recognize the significance of his words when he spoke of fate. Fate is so strong that even things which seem impossible become possible if they are meant to be, and even stronger than fate is God. As they say in Hindi, Khuda Meherban, Khuda Meherban, To Gadha Bhi Pahalwan. If God is gracious, even a donkey can become a wrestler. Even Jendu Kumar, quite baiting me. Yes, even Jendu Kumar, but if and only if God went along with his schemes. But God is not going to do that. So you can forget about it and so can be. So can he. At least God was kind enough to let repay finally repay you. Nature is very kind to me, Robbie. That's all I can tell you. That nature is very kind to me. There is absolutely nothing that God cannot do. I have seen it over and over again in my life. This is why I pray a day and night for more bhakti. Because I know that if my devotion is truly sincere, God will provide me with whatever it is that I need. After final grueling round of university exams in the fall of 1979, I proceeded to Bombay and watched Repay continue to win their during the early months of 1980, around this time, Vimalananda bought Onslaught, a reliable class 1 horse, from Bowman Hon Honsatia. Though Onsla Onslaught had never won for Bowman, he did for Vimalananda, and it began to seem that all our horses were doing well. Even Bajrangi, the last horse Vimalananda had purchased, when he kept his string with Lafange. In one of his most egregious transgressions, Lafange had insisted that Vimalananda purchase this horse and Vimalananda had regretted his acquisition ever since. For one thing, he would say his color is liver chestnut and everyone knows that liver chestnut rarely keeps good health. In Bajrangi's case, at least this was true. Jockeys would complain that when they sat on him, he would try to move his back out from under them. 
as if they were causing him pain. No one could discover any obvious pathology or do him any good. Not even Dr. Singh, the eccentric vet who sought to prove his expertise at equine massage, equine massage by flaunting it as his copy of the Turaga Samhita, a Sanskrit treatise on horses. I have meanwhile been studying Ayurveda herbology at the college and I came one morning to Vimalananda with a proposal that we try on Bajrangi, a local preparation of Balataka, an extremely poisonous fruit which when appropriately manufactured often shows good results in such varied afflictions as goiter paralysis and infertility. infertility. At his wit's end over Bajrangi, Vimalananda agreed and being dutiful experimenters, he and I decided to try some of his restorative as well just to see what it would do. The horse got two tablespoons and Vimalananda and I took a half tablespoon each. The medication which had to, which had in fact not been properly prepared gave the horse extreme colic and us two humans extreme skin rashes. At least Tehmul could report that Bajrangi who luckily survived became significantly more spirited afterwards than he had been before the medicine, though he was still uneasy when mounted. Vimalananda and I also noticed vastly improved jest and energy. Vimalananda's skin being darker than mine, his rash disappeared a mere year, two or three days after he began to ingest the antidote. A Balakanta reaction is always more severe in a white-skinned individual, though even with the antidote it took a few more two weeks, a full two weeks for my skin to fade from bright pink to back to normal. Everyone at the college thought I had been fiercely sunburnt, but it was just the effects of Urushial, the poison in Balataka, which is also the poison in poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, cashew shells, mango skins and Chinese liquor. It was a poison ivy rash, but from the inside out, which meant that I felt the intense itch about an itch below the surface of my skin. It like the pinkness gradually faded with the antidote, but it cost me a couple of sleepless nights of vain attempts to scratch it. Thank God! We knew what was the main ingredient in this concussion, said Vimalananda to me, once it became clear that my reaction would indeed disappear. To be continued.